When the global reserve currency is literally reliant on the sale of oil, the world has a massive carbon emissions problem. Not to mention the fact that the petrodollar is defended by the US military's global presence, which has a carbon output the size of a mid-sized nation, is exaggerated in size by America's need to protect the dollar, and is boosted by the oil price spiking wars it fights on various continents. Weapons of mass destruction. It is truly impossible for the petrodollar system to be green when it is based on black gold. Part 1. Birth of the Petrodollar The British Empire was the unquestioned economic hegemon of the 19th century, but began to lose steam early in the 20th century, especially after World War I. The United States emerged much healthier than war-torn Europe, and as the country with by far the most gold. By the outbreak of World War II, the dollar had unquestionably eclipsed the pound as the world's most influential national currency. Few dollars went abroad in those days, while America piled up most of the world's gold at Fort Knox. What had happened during the war was a lot of these European countries, they, they had actually given uh, or entrusted the US with their gold reserves for safekeeping. There's a whole story about European nations kind of fleeing with their gold, uh, getting it to the U.S. because that was considered to be the safe place. As I had four and a half million dollars of Swedish gold on board and signed to the United States, I, I thought it my duty that I should leave as soon as possible. Effectively, the U.S. in 44 took this bargain to the world and to their allies saying, we will administer the monetary standard, it will be based on gold, we will, for the most part, hold everyone's gold, and all of your sovereign currencies will just be different weights of the dollar, which will be backed by gold and redeemable for gold. The representatives of 44 nations here in Bretton Woods are taking steps to prevent a repetition of the currency chaos which is usually followed in the wake of war. In the waning months of World War II, leaders from 44 countries gathered in a hotel in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, to choose a new financial bedrock. British economist John Maynard Keynes pushed the idea of the Bancor, a global unit of account that many nations would manage. But the US preferred the idea of the dollar at the center, pegged to gold at $35 per ounce. Since international trade deficits still had to be settled in gold, America's substantial control of the world's gold supply and favorable balance of payments position provided the leverage to get its way. The Bretton Woods is kind of a metonymy for that entire system that the U.S. used as it became the sole superpower. You know, the U.S. embarked on the Marshall Plan. General George C. Marshall, the United States Secretary of State in 1947 made a dramatic appeal to the people of Europe. If they would work together, the United States would supply the money for food and raw materials essential to... They issued a huge amount of credit and, you know, distributed capital globally to sort of help rebuild Europe. Because they were the unmitigated victor, they were able to effectively seize control. Over the coming decades, the world shifted to the Bretton Woods standard, with national currencies pegged to adjustable dollar amounts where the U.S. was trusted to custody and hold enough gold to prop up the whole system. Up until the early 1960s, it did a reasonably good job. Dollars became the dominant medium of exchange for international settlement, backed by a promise to pay in gold. Every dollar we want a foreign country to spend on American goods has to come first from Americans themselves, either as payment for imported goods and services as overseas investments, or as government aid. So now we're importing more. These imports are sending more dollars overseas, creating more demand there for American products than ever before. America became the largest creditor nation and an economic powerhouse. However, after the assassination of President Kennedy, 
the U.S. government chose a path of huge social and military spending. Will you join in the battle to build the Great Society? With President Johnson's Great Society social programs and the invasion of Vietnam, U.S. debt skyrocketed. In the 60s, the world, generally speaking, started to question the U.S.'s ability to hold the gold peg at $35 an ounce. Number one, with just huge war spending for Vietnam, but also the Great Society. So this was known as like guns and butter. And um, it was unclear to the world whether or not the U.S. would be able to keep its promise to redeem their gold. In the late 1960s, U.S. public sector deficits were large enough to prompt complaints from France that Washington was exploiting its reserve currency status to collect seniorage from America's foreign creditors by printing dollars. Vis -vis de by 1971, U.S. debt had simply grown too high. Just $11 billion in gold backed $24 billion in dollars. The French government wanted its gold back before a dollar devaluation. That August, French President Pompidou sent a battleship to New York City to collect his nation's gold holdings from the Federal Reserve. And the British asked the U.S. to prepare $3 billion worth of gold held in Fort Knox for withdrawal. In a televised speech on August 15, 1971, President Richard Nixon told the American people that the U.S. would no longer redeem dollars for gold. The Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other... This was like a reaction to this uh, world demand for their gold back. And he said, no, we're not going to give it back. We're ending the gold window. You know, other nations can no longer redeem their dollars for gold. Now, this was pitched as like a, a bid to save the economy as the U.S. was entering into a very inflationary decade. As a result, the dollar was devalued by more than 10 percent and the Bretton Woods system ceased to exist. There was a geopolitical moment where U.S. dominance was called into question. Adding even more pressure, in 1973, the Arab petroleum exporters of OPEC decided to quadruple the price of world oil and embargo the U.S. In 73, we have like this dynamic in oil really shifting. So, First of all, you have this change between like colonial powers kind of controlling oil to sovereign dictatorships controlling oil. Nations like Saudi Arabia and Qatar, Kuwait, etc. Oil was first discovered in Iran and Iraq in the 1930s, a few years later in Saudi Arabia, and then in the 1950s in other countries on the Arabian Peninsula. And it's been gushing out of the ground ever since. OPEC, this association of oil producing countries, really had a lot of leverage and, and, and power, whereas they didn't before. So in 73, when the U.S. supported Israel in the Yom Kippur War, as a response, the Arab nations decided to both, like, jack up the price of oil by 4x and announce an embargo on the United States. This is NBC Nightly News, Wednesday, October 17th. The Middle East War produced developments all over the world today. The oil-producing countries of the Arab world decided to use their oil as a political weapon they will reduce oil production by 5% a month until the Israelis withdraw from occupied territories. In just a few years, a barrel of oil rose from less than $2 to nearly $12. We are heading toward the most acute shortages of energy since World War II. America is 80 million gallons of oil a day short now that the Arabs have turned off the tap. There is no way that she can make up the loss. For the moment, America has reached the bottom of the barrel. How much have you got left in there? None. It's empty. There is no oil. There's none to get. This was kind of like a historic shift where these oil countries could now actually hold a lot of leverage and power. I think what we have as an oil weapon is far more greater than what we did. What we did is nothing at all. 
I think we can cut down production to, let's say, 20%. You think Europe or, or Japan or the United States can survive with this? I saw officials say those long gasoline lines will probably be with us for the rest of the summer, and the price at the pumps will keep on getting higher. Now, this created an enormous flow of cash for the Saudis and, and the OPEC nations. So much wealth, they couldn't spend it all. Uh, so there was like this mutual dilemma where like the Saudis and the oil states didn't know what to do with the money. And the U.S. had like a need for people to buy its debt. Faced with double digit inflation and declining global faith in the dollar, Nixon and his Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, came up with an idea that would alter the fate of the world. 1974, they sent new Treasury Secretary William Simon to Saudi Arabia. So the idea is they were like, we need to get other nations to finance our debt because we're not going to do it through raising taxes. There's no way. So through a bunch of meetings in 74 and 75, uh, Kissinger and Nixon and William Simon, the Treasury Secretary, basically figured out a deal. We maybe would call it a pact of the devil, given the Saudis' proclivity for human rights violations. The deal was that these dollars that these OPEC nations were earning, that they would not only force the sale of oil to be in dollars, so all oil sales were now denominated in dollars, but they would take the earnings and they would actually buy U.S. debt with, with the profits. And this is what we call petrodollar recycling. You know, the Saudis could have just kind of pursued a broader portfolio of investment. They didn't have to go so heavy on U.S. debt. They didn't have to price oil in dollars. These were decisions they made in exchange for protection. The basic framework was strikingly simple. The U.S. would buy oil from Saudi Arabia and provide the kingdom military aid and equipment. In return, the Saudis would plow billions of their petrodollar revenue back into treasuries and finance America's spending. This was the moment that the U.S. dollar was officially married to oil. Part two, impact of the petrodollar. By 1975, other OPEC nations followed Saudi Arabia's lead. If you wanted to buy oil from them and their store of nearly 80% of the world's petroleum reserves, you had to pay in dollars. You know, Nixon, Kissinger, Simon, they ended up kind of saving the day for the US in a lot of ways, uh, at least for US elites. Uh, by figuring out a way to, to keep dollar hegemony alive. In 1974, 20% of global oil was still transacted in the British pound, but that number fell to 6% by 1976. By 1975, Saudi imports of U.S. military equipment had risen from $300 million to more than $5 billion. Today's topic, arms sales. A useful foreign policy tool? To what extent should an arms transfer or sales program play a role in our foreign policy? Senator Biden. Uh, there are instances where arms transfers are, in fact, uh, uh, absolutely uh, essential for U.S. interest, and others where we have made bad or incorrect judgments about the stability of the nations to whom we are transferring their arms. Okay, elevating the weapons. Things on test. As president, I ask for your support in the decision I made to stand up for what's right and condemn what's wrong, all in the cause of peace. In my direction, elements of the 82nd Airborne Division, as well as key units of the United States Air Force, are arriving today to take up defensive positions in Saudi Arabia. Since its creation, the petrodollar system has enabled the continuation of the U.S. as a military financial hegemon and the ability to run humongous deficits to finance wars and social programs, all in part paid for by other countries. Our economy runs on a complex system of exchange of goods and services. 
in which money plays a key part. Coin, currency, savings, and checking accounts, the overall supply of money is managed by the Federal Reserve. Petrodollar recycling over time pushed down interest rates and allowed the U.S. to issue debt very cheaply. OPEC dollar profits were recycled into U.S. treasuries to subsidize the debt-happy policies of the U.S. government, as well as the debt-happy consumption of its citizenry. Another kind of sad legacy of the, of the petrodollar system was that essentially a lot of poorer nations were forced to import oil. Now it was like super hard for them to do that. They had to structure their economy in a way to like get dollars and they had to ignore domestic investment and spending. And this led to a huge number of debt crises in the, in the third world in the 80s and 90s. Mexico's economic crisis deepened today with stocks dropping sharply and the peso still under fire. The country has a growing trade deficit, huge foreign debt and soaring inflation. It also has $7 billion in short-term bonds coming due in the next three weeks, much of them held by American investors. You had a system where the U.S. and a lot of rich countries really benefited, but a lot of the world really suffered. This is a very imperfect system, and it pits the U.S. against its allies, and it also pits various social strata within the U.S. against each other. Domestically, certain factions of America have prospered because of the petrodollar, but the impact on the median American has been negative. Corporations and asset owners have benefited most in the system's low interest rate environment. The U.S. financial sector has ballooned, now accounting for 20% of GDP. Money market matters. The, the hectic trading there's, there's on world a... currency markets that finally put a break on the rampant United States dollar. This financialization has enriched the asset holding elite on the coast. Could a billion dollars buy the White House? While ruining Rust Belt workers who deal with stagnant wages. Japan. These guys are out of work. Why? That's the question you just said. Why? Well, why? This was Steel Town, USA. It's going to be Ghost Town, USA, in 1982. Am I right or wrong, Sam? Last winter, the U.S. Steel Corporation shut down this mill in Youngstown, Ohio. They said it wasn't profitable. Today, some of the workers from the As the petrodollar system kept international demand for the dollar artificially strong throughout the decades, America's manufacturing base became weak and uncompetitive and lost jobs overseas. Japan's steelworks lead the world in productivity and have an equally impressive record in energy conservation. Computers minimize waste by guaranteeing production exactly according to specification. Normally, a currency that is too strong ends up creating a deficit issue and is forced to devalue to sell exports. But that has never happened with the U.S. due to the continual payment of its deficits by foreign nations. To remain the world's reserve currency, the U.S. must provide global liquidity by running increasingly large deficits. And so everybody looks at the charts that show things going badly wrong in the 70s, right? What happened in 1971, et cetera. One of the things that started to go wrong was our manufacturing sector just started to structurally decline as U.S. exports became less and less competitive. And we started to run this huge trade deficit, which meant that we would engage in consumerism and import things from abroad, export dollars, and export, you know, relatively little of our own, uh, which meant that blue-collar manufacturing would be structurally suppressed. And so, effectively, the U.S. working class was sacrificed at the altar of the dollar. A median male 
income today is just not enough to support a household. Inflation is going up. Everything's getting more expensive. No matter what you do, you, as soon as you walk out of the house, everything's going up. Your gas bills keep going up. Electric bills, uh, your gasoline. And, you know, that's had really negative effects on society. It's no coincidence the U.S. is among the most financialized of the developed nations, and it has some of the highest inequality of any sort of OECD developed nation. Uh, it's a direct consequence of this system. And, you know, now we see the political ramifications of that. That's why you see the growth of populism. But in our nation today, we have an extreme disparity between the rich and the poor, that elections are bought and sold, uh, this political enthusiasm for trade wars. They are ripping us like we've never been ripped before. If you look at Japan, if you look at China. The dollar system does not work for everyone, and we're kind of reaching a tipping point here where people are sort of starting to rebel a little bit against the status quo. Find the flag! Find the flag! Part 3. American Foreign Policy and the Petrodollar. In Moscow, the hammer and sickle is lured for the last time, and an era comes to an end. After the fall of the Soviets, we did not do another Bretton Woods. Like, the world did not come together to, to create a new financial system. We kind of remained on dollar hegemony. But the euro really threatened that. The funny world busy gearing up, ready to trade in euros from Monday. I mean, here you have a, a larger population than the U.S. coming together, very powerful economies. And if you read media from the time, there was a lot of talk about the euro unseating the dollar. So U.S. policymakers were concerned about this. And one of the biggest threats was this idea of the petro-euro, right? In October 2000, Saddam Hussein did attempt to alter the petrodollar system when he announced that Iraq would sell oil in euros, not dollars. By February 2003, he had sold 3.3 billion barrels of oil for 26 billion euros. With his French and German trading partners, the Petro Euro was born, which, if expanded, would help a euro market develop against lots of other currencies, boosting the euro's strength and eroding the dollar's exorbitant privilege. Iraq continues to flaunt its hostility toward America and to support terror. This is a regime that has already used poison gas to murder thousands of its own citizens, leaving the bodies of mothers huddled over their dead children. The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. But one month later, the U.S., aided by the United Kingdom, invaded Iraq and overthrew Saddam. Saddam and his sons say they will not leave Iraq. American forces on the Iraqi border are on short notice to move out in what now has been officially labeled Operation Iraqi Freedom. When the president says go, look out, it's hammer time. By June, Iraq was back to selling oil in dollars again. Did America go to war to defend the petrodollar? This possibility is almost never discussed in retrospective analyses of the war. What other explanation do we have that's, that, that makes sense? We know that it wasn't Operation Iraqi Freedom. It wasn't for human rights. We know that. We know that there was no connection to Al-Qaeda. And we know that there were no WMDs. So, you know, and we also know that the idea that it was like to counter Iran doesn't make much sense because in the 80s, we, we were funding Saddam to counter Iran. Good evening. The U.S. Embassy in Tehran has been invaded and occupied by Iranian students. The Americans inside have been taken prisoner. According to a student spokesman, Held as hostages, Shaw is returned from the United States, where he's receiving medical treatment for cancer. So none of the big explanations make a lot of sense. So today there's no consensus among 
you know, mainstream thinkers, po- politicians, historians, no one really knows why we went to war in Iraq. They call it a, a war in search of a reason. And I think this is a very compelling explanation. It wasn't just to get oil. I mean, we w- the U.S. wasn't importing uh, that much oil from the Middle East at the time. We get most of our oil from ourselves, from Canada, from Mexico, from Venezuela. So it wasn't about the loot itself. It was about the continued system and making sure that all the nations in the world price oil uh, in dollars. I would say that American foreign policy has, has protected that to the extent it can. There's no shortage of odious dictators in the world, but um, you know we choose to go after a few very specifically, and it's not a coincidence, the ones the U.S. has gone after. So obviously Saddam completely contrived war, no clear justification for it. Six years ago, the Arab world acquired a new revolutionary star. He was a young man, only 28 years old, born deep in the Libyan desert, where his parents still live in a tent. Gaddafi, of course, he didn't try and sell oil for euros, he tried to sell oil for gold. In the months leading up to the military intervention, he called on African and Muslim nations to join together to create this new currency that would rival the dollar and euro. They would sell oil and other resources around the world only for gold dinars. A few years later, Gaddafi was dead, thanks to the US airstrike and, and the local militia. This is a momentous day in the history of Libya. The dark shadow of tyranny has been lifted uh, there's another dictator that tried to sell oil or not dollars, which was Chavez. He threatened to do it. Venezuela's socialist president, Hugo Chavez, has condemned America's war on terror from the beginning. No se puede responder al terror con más terror. And he's associated with some of Washington's least favorite people, such as Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi, and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. And uh, we unsuccessfully tried to launch a coup. So there are three case studies of dictators saying, we want to sell our oil commodity for something other than dollars. And in each case, the US successfully or unsuccessfully deposed that dictator. Beyond the Iraq war, there are several other key and much more obvious negative externalities of the petrodollar system. American support for the Saudi dictatorship is one. The fact that we propped up the House of Saud for so many decades, both Gulf Wars, we came in to defend them in different ways. Fifteen of the 19 9-11 hijackers were Saudi. Uh, Bin Laden was Saudi, and yet we never went after Saudi. And in fact, every time the Congress tried to go after Saudi, it was snuffed out. U.S. Attorney General William Barr said that the name was a state secret and its disclosure would cause significant harm to national security. The U.S. government has forcibly resisted any attempt to investigate the Saudi regime for involvement in the attack and instead invaded and bombed other countries in retaliation. America strikes back. Afghanistan is pounded with bombs and missiles from the air and sea. We are supported by the collective will of the world. When Americans invaded Afghanistan, the government quietly allowed the U.S. to use Saudi air bases for command and control operations. These are just a few examples of how, despite the Saudi regime's bloody war in Yemen, its torture of female political prisoners and its assassination of Khashoggi. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman personally approved the murder of the exiled journalist Jamal Khashoggi in 20. America's relationship with the kingdom remains steadfast and protected at the highest levels. Part four, towards a multipolar world. U.S. foreign policy has kept the petrodollar dominant for many decades. 
but its power is inarguably beginning to wane. Let's just put it this way. If the U.S. was in its current state of affairs, I don't think we, we would have invaded Iraq back in 20, 2003. We were at like an apex of hyperpower at that point. Our generation has now heard history's call, and we will answer it. The Biden administration, you know, they talk about dollar primacy. It's still important, but there's just not much geopolitically we can do. We no longer have the same geopolitical power. And, and in the last few years, indeed, Russia and China, all these other countries have started to do more business in their own currencies. And, you know, we're watching the decline of the dollar. In late 2013, 2014, China stopped buying new treasuries. The world has been like net negative treasuries since then. So they're sort of discording. Now, I'm not going to say it's going to end tomorrow because everyone who's ever tried to predict the end of this system always has egg on their face because it lasts a lot longer than people think. But it's reasonable to think that in the next 10, 15 years, you'll start seeing a real shift, whether it's to a bipolar world or a multipolar world or potentially a world where, you know, we no longer have the petrodollar as kind of the reserve currency propping up U.S. debt, but, but rather maybe the Bitcoin standard. I don't believe that we should ever have a good money again before we take the thing out of the hands of government. Because we can't take them violently out of the hands of government. All we can do is, by some sly roundabout way, <laughs> introduce something they can't stop. The world's multipolar drift is inevitable. No one country can, in the near future, gain as much power as America had at the end of the 20th century. The US will still be a powerhouse for a long time to come, but so will China, the EU, Russia, India, and other nations. And they may compete in a new monetary system that moves away from the petrodollar and all of its costly externalities, a neutral standard that plays to the strengths of open societies does not depend on dictators or fossil fuels and is ultimately run by citizens, not the entrenched elite.